Hi everyone, Asalaamu Alaikum. I believe we have reached a quorum and so we will begin. People will probably continue to connect on the web but since we have a lot of material to cover tonight and so that we can let you folks get back to the good work you are doing, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the country you are joining us from. Welcome to the webinar, Major Trends in Public Service Reform a web-based online session arranged by Medina Institute of Leadership and Entrepreneurship. We're glad you can join us today. I'm Ali Jafri. I'll be a moderator tonight. Um, I think I have corresponded with most of you either on the email or phone. I'm going to have a quick overview of Mile and the speaker and also walk through some housekeeping items. Then I'll turn it over to our featured presenter, Mr. Tony D, who will start the presentation. We are webcasting today from Toronto, Canada and Medina, Saudi Arabia. A brief introduction to all of you from um, MILE. The Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE, brings senior executives and high potential leaders from all over the world to discover new dimensions in leadership and management practices and help them grow in their business careers. We offer participants in our programs priceless engagements with the world's most influential academic and business leaders on a range of critical management and leadership issues. We empower them with the desired leadership skills to help successfully transform their organizations and reach their personal goals. Our speaker for tonight is Professor Tony Dean, is a professor in the School of Public Policy and Governance, University of Toronto. In 2010-11, he was a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's an advisor to the governments and international organizations on public service reform and on building capacity for policy and delivery. From 2002 to 2008, Mr. Dean was a secretary of the cabinet and head of the 66,000 member Ontario, Ontario Public Service. He has an extensive experience in public sector leadership, public policy and public administration. Mr. Dean is also a recipient of the Order of Ontario. He serves on the Board of Ontario Agency for Health Protection and Promotion and as a member of the Certification Board of the Institute for Citizens Centre Service. Uh, Professor Dean will present his material tonight, a copy of which you will also receive in either PDF or PPT format in your email. Uh, and, um, and once he'll conclude his presentation tonight, we will take the questions. We would ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentations. Some of you responded to our email queries, inquiries asking for questions in advance and we'll try to address them in the course of the presentation or in the Q&A section at the end. I should mention here that the content of this webinar, uh, Major Trends in Public Ser Service Reform, is necessarily broad and we have constructed into provide high level concepts and details that we thought would be of interest. We know that some of you may have questions or issues related to more specific topics or circumstances in which you find yourself and your programs. We will do our best to address these within the webinar, but we can also follow up with you directly, directly later via email. I will also be distributing to you via email um, post-webinar an evaluation. Uh, this, this will give you a chance to evaluate this session and also suggest additional topics for which you would like to participate in online webinars with us. Your feedback is very valuable to us, so please do take the minutes, a uh, couple of minutes after the webinar, once you receive in your email, to complete the survey uh, when it lands in your inbox. Uh, a brief housekeeping items. If you are having trouble with the webinar software, please see if you have all the uh, pop-ups enabled, like Java enabled, and you have a pop-up blockers disabled. If you can connect to the webinar and the audio portion, but might kicked off at any time, just reconnect using the instructions provided in the email. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn to Professor Tony Dean, but just bear with us for two minutes. I have to make him a presenter through this webinar console. Dear Tony, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thanks very much. Um, I believe, Tony, so, uh, uh, you can begin. I, we have a quorum. We have um, 
attendees list growing and they will keep on connecting so I believe you can start. Okay, can you hear me then Ali? Yeah, I can hear you. Maybe the uh, audience can hear and they can type yes. I believe they are hearing us. Okay, very good. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, welcome to those online. It's uh, a terrific privilege for me to talk to you today. I'm a public uh, service leader, former public service leader as you know, and I now teach and I work as a consultant. I've, I've led major public service reforms in Canada and I've also had the opportunity to look at trends in other countries. The main thing that interests me is how we can make government and especially our public services work better and add greater public value. So I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so sharing some experiences and also some observations about public service reform. There are some quite exciting changes going on in government I think around the world in response to a number of pressures for reform and I think that there's some commonality of those pressures and there's certainly some commonality of responses. So um, we're going to, uh, oh, just a moment, I'm just, for some reason I can't advance this slide, so just give me a moment. There we go. Yeah. We're going to start by looking at pressures for reform, and these vary in, in by country, but, but the first is citizen expectations and, and how they are changing very rapidly. We, we find that our citizens want more from government. They want the same sort of 24-hour access to government services that they can get through the private sector on the internet. Uh, secondly, a uh, significant number of countries are facing some financial hurdles, and even those that aren't are swept up by global economic uncertainty. Whether or not we have economic problems or not, it's, it's generally true these days that our leaders, uh, our country leaders and our state and provincial leaders, are increasingly interested in seeing results and outcomes for citizens. And I think they've observed, as I have, that, that we're pretty good in government at planning, but not always as good when it comes to implementation. Fourth, we find that countries are having a little bit of difficulty tackling complex so-called wicked policy issues like high unemployment or complex health issues or environmental issues. And that's very much connected, I think, to the siloed methods of public service delivery that, that many of us work with. They, they no longer work very well in responding to complex and multifaceted problems and citizen needs. And the bottom line here is that uh, old ways of de delivering public services don't seem to be working. I'm going to cover uh, five areas or trends in public service reform. And this represents the way that many countries are responding to the challenges that I've just outlined. Uh, a citizen focus, looking at the uh, at government uh, through the eyes of citizens, the so-called outside-in perspective, tackling silos and, and um, yeah, fragmented delivery systems, choosing big priorities, a small number of big priorities and aligning budgets around them and driving a small number of priorities. And we're also going to touch on accountability and transparency in reporting. So let's take a closer look at each of these in turn. In terms of citizens' focus, uh, we're finding, first of all, that a number of countries are tending to listen much more carefully to what citizens say their needs are, rather than us making assumptions about that. Uh, so we're looking at service delivery from a citizen perspective. In Canada, for example, we have what we call citizens first surveys. They're quite sophisticated measures of citizen satisfaction with services. And we're now able to compare the service quality from province to province and between the federal government and, uh, and uh, various provinces. And of course, that adds a little bit of transparency and competition into the way that uh, uh, we think about service delivery. We're finding as well that many countries are giving citizens and organizations much more access to government data for use and reuse. We know that data.gov in the US is doing this, that in Germany, in Cologne, 
there's been experimentation with web-based open budgeting processes. And uh, that's an approach that was also used in the west of Canada in the city of Calgary here recently and, and quite successfully. Secondly, governments tend to, uh, 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 tend to become much more responsive to local circumstances. They, they figured out that one-size-fits-all approaches to service delivery don't work well for everyone, um, particularly in the health and social service sectors. The needs and demographics of urban populations versus rural, for example, uh, is, is one example of that. And that in turn involves giving citizens and clients much more choice about the service provider and the package of services that will work for them or their family. The, um, the UK and Sweden are also experimenting with what's called co-production in which clients participate in the design of government service bundles and that often involves clients taking on responsibility uh, for um, uh, as part of a service agreement such as for example taking uh, employment training. And lastly, uh, the UK in particular is experimenting with place-based budgeting and uh, service delivery at the community level with some very positive results. We've also seen experimentation with personalized budgets where vouchers are used to buy a package of personalized community services uh, that are available from a group of both public and private sector uh, providers. I'm going to move on to, to tackling silos right now, which is somewhat uh, of an obsession of mine. I, I see siloed departments and siloed ministries and siloed governments everywhere I look. Um, this is really important in uh, modernization and uh, reform of public services. Developing a more joined up or, or a corporate public service culture, I think, is a, is a precondition for making our governments work more effectively. We know the global economy and our national economies are connected in, in all sorts of ways and we're all affected by convergence in, in every aspect of our personal and our professional lives. Uh, big policy challenges of poverty, economic development and protecting the environment cross boundaries. They, they don't tend to resign in, uh, reside in one policy field or one ministry or one department. Um, they, they affect all of government or many ministries and in many cases they affect more than one level of government. But if you take that picture and then take a look at our organizations in the public sector and in government, I think that many organizations in the public sector remain remarkably siloed. And, and we've seen a shift to try and break down those organizational silos to create more joined up organizations. Uh, departments are working more closely together, ministries are working more closely together, and, and levels of government are working more closely together. Uh, ideally, when people join up or, or work in a more integrated way, they, they're integrating their thinking and work on policy development, they're integrating in planning, and they're inter integrating and working together on delivery. And, and it, this area of delivery has become fairly huge in recent years. That there's, a, there's a much greater focus on implementation of plans and policies than we would have seen, uh, for example, uh, a decade ago. Uh, here's just a quick snapshot of how uh, we integrated services in Ontario. And, and these are, these are services that, uh, that I led, and so I, I know a little bit about. Um, on the left, you see how we restructured our internal or so-called back office services. Uh, we moved from 24 or 25 ministry-based IT systems and HR systems and uh, bill payment systems, and we developed a corporate approach to this. Um, and key to that was a corporate platform for IT as was standardizing and consolidating many of the back office functions and, uh, and services. So, so all of those services that were previously duplicated across 24 or 25 ministries are now uh, provided corporately. And by the way, that includes a corporate approach to procurement so that we can achieve uh, economies of scale. 
Now moving from the back office, if you like, to front counter services where government comes into contact with, with citizens and clients, you can see on the right hand side of this slide that we consolidated our front service counters uh, from about a dozen ministries and we put them under a, under a Service Ontario brand, almost like the front counter of a bank which offer, offers a, a, a suite of services. We started up by, by joining together provincial services, for example, driver licenses and health cards and social insurance cards, and, and then we added some municipal services behind those counters, and, and lastly, some, some federal uh, personnel as well, which means that a citizen today in Ontario can go to one office and one counter and register for a new birth of a child, which is a municipal responsibility, can obtain a birth certificate for the child, which is a provincial government responsibility, and a social insurance number, which is a federal responsibility, all from one counter, rather than previously going to three completely separate and geographically distinct offices. That's also available through one web portal. And and interestingly now, a birth parent can actually access that web uh, portal from terminals in some of Ontario's hospitals. So you can actually do it before you leave uh, the, um, the, the, the birth hospital. Now, there are huge service improvements uh, rolled up in, in these changes. Uh, faster and more accurate services, ministry offices roll together uh, with the uh, considerable saving in, in real estate costs. And of course, the more we move services online, uh, we see satis citizen satisfaction really skyrocketing. And we see costs moving from uh, dollars per transaction from the old paper-based approach to cents per transaction uh, through online portals. So there's a real shift, a fundamental shift in terms of technology in driving uh, public services online in many, many countries. There's a third level of integration that has emerged relatively recently and it's something that, that I'm really, really excited about and I've actually done a fair amount of research on. And, and this is the integration of human services. Um, it's, it's a new and it's a much more complex frontier in service delivery. It's not about delivering health cards or driver licenses or or, or parking permits, it's, it's, it's about that world of human services like health, social services and children's services and, and certainly I can say uh, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, in New Zealand, in other places that I've studied, these tend to be highly fragmented services and it, it, it's usually up to the client or the client's family to help that client navigate their way from the hospital system into the community care system and into, in, and, and into for example, back into, uh, into home care. And we know that this is a sector where there are a number of clients who have multiple needs and, and who receive services from a large number of agencies. And those agencies are not as linked up and joined up as they probably could be and should be. Now, now we've got a number of countries tackling uh, this opportunity, and I call it an opportunity, in some exciting ways. And there are some examples on this page which range from electronic health records, which is about, of course, joining up siloed uh, patient or client data. Uh, we have examples of human service delivery, and finally we have examples of getting budgets and services moved much closer to local communities, such as the example with Total Place and community budgets in the UK. You'll note, I think, that, that the common denominator uh, between all of these examples is that they all involve some form of, uh, of integration. I want to move on now to setting priorities. Uh, you probably in your own organizations have experienced uh, the sort of feeling that this fellow has in the cartoon where he's out of frustration saying to his boss, uh, just tell me which group I, of, of priorities I should stop working on. Do you want me to stop doing the essential stuff, the critical stuff, or, or, or the must-haves? Um, it's sometimes really good to know what's important in our organizations, and, and it's, it's actually vital for uh, success. 
we often find in our organizations that we seem to be working on everything at once and we thus spread ourselves fairly thinly and we often feel that we're doing nothing really well. Uh, when everything is a priority as the saying goes, nothing is a priority. So high performing governments that we've observed in various jurisdictions and public service organizations are tending increasingly to focus on a small number of key priorities. And, and doing this is, is proving to be important, especially when we're trying to tackle tough or so-called wicked policy challenges such as those in, in health and education. It's not surprising that, that this works best where policy priorities are lined up with budget priorities. And, and that might seem obvious and, and in, our, in our governments and in our organizations it may seem that way on paper, but I'm finding that, that it's not always the case. So again, breaking down silos and getting all of the important players working together and joined up around the implementation of a small number of priorities is very, very important. We know that as hard as we try, uh, many priority initiatives tend to be derailed by uh, previously unidentified risks or distractors. We, we have temporary crises affecting governments. Uh, we have uh, unforeseen circumstances arising. So it's really important that we have strategies in place to identify and to mitigate against these uh, potential uh, distractors. I want to move on now to accountability. Uh, who's in charge? Uh, we, we can identify large priorities and we can focus resources on them, but Big projects need someone in charge and accountable for results. Uh, just like our discussion of priorities, if, if everyone's in charge, no one's in charge. And in, in my old job in the public service, when, when I heard that a committee uh, was uh, responsible for delivery of something, it, it made me very, very nervous. And uh, I used to say, uh, uh, let me know who's wearing the yellow hat on this. Who's wearing the yellow foreman's hat of, of, the, of the sort that in Canada here, it's certainly we, we see people wearing on, on construction sites. And I know the color of the hat changes from uh, a place to place. But just like our discussion of priorities, if everyone is in charge, uh, then often nobody is in charge. And, and that just doesn't work very well. Um, uh, th that's an issue particularly because as we try to cross organizational boundaries and work in a joined up way, accountability becomes more challenging. In, in those cases, we do sometimes appoint a cross-departmental committee to provide oversight and, and that's good, that's fine because we, we need everybody's input, we need everybody's ownership of cross-departmental or cross-ministry initiatives. But it's always really important to appoint an overall project executive, uh, someone who will uh, occasionally lose sleep over the work. And I find that in, in the engineering profession, we do this really well. If we're building, for example, a, a, a large piece of infra infrastructure, uh, there's generally, we generally know who's in charge of that and who's accountable for it. In the public sector, certainly in my experience, um, we, we may not be as diligent in appointing uh, single points of accountability and we usually suffer when, uh, when that occurs. The last of the five areas I'm going to touch on is measurement and reporting. Uh, getting things done in government more effectively is one thing. Uh, letting people know how we're doing is, is another and this area of measurement and transparent reporting is becoming more and more important. We, we're all tending to focus more on outcomes rather than inputs. Um, many of our reporting though tends to stay inside our departments or, or inside our government. Reporting results to citizens is, is a significant part of many countries' efforts to improve government transparency. But, but it's a, it's, it's a two-way street. It, it, it also indicates that we're listening to citizen uh, concerns and that, and that uh, citizens can have uh, some sort of influence on, on how government operates and, and how it provides services for them. A transparency of, of goals and priorities can also help to create pressure for effective delivery. 
if a government or a government leader or one of our state leaders makes a public proclamation of a particular priority or goal, it, it sure wakes us up in public service organisations and, and gets us taking this seriously because a political leader now has um, a commitment out there publicly and increasingly our leaders are uh, uh, occasionally uh, held to account uh, for a delivery on, on promises. Uh, this tends to work well, especially if it's clear who internally is wearing the yellow hat. To the extent that we individualize accountability, uh, that kind of transparency can create some considerable pressure for successful delivery. From the perspective of our leaders though, the leaders of our countries and our, and our various jurisdictions, they have to make choices about whether about the magnitude of those targets, whether to make them stretch targets that will really pull the very best out of uh, public service organizations and, and increase pressure for significant change. Of course, when you go public with stretch targets or aggressive targets, there is some degree of risk involved, but it certainly does create pressure for delivery. The other choice, of course, and, and I've seen people do this in Canada a fair amount, is to under-promise with the hope of overachieving. Uh, that, of course, is it's safer, it's less risky, but it doesn't carry with it the advantage of creating internal pressure within our organizations to achieve very significant changes in short time frames. The important point here really is that, is that this is a question that should be sorted out uh, up front as we think about communications and not sorted out in the doing or of implementation because of course, the worst case is to, is to uh, make a, a big splash and then fail. Final point here is that moving the numbers alone, moving numbers on, on a graph will not always impress people. Uh, Tony Blair found this out in the UK. He, he massively increased uh, literacy scores and numeracy scores for, uh, for kids in schools and he drove wait, wait times down for key hospital procedures, but, but the public didn't applaud that as much as might have been expected and I've seen this phenomenon in, in, in Canada occurring as well. The reason for that seems to be that personal experience of service uh, obviously matters most. It, it's what happened the last time you visit, visited an emergency room or when you visited your child's school. And in the UK's case, there was such disruption in the school system. We had a lot of unhappy teachers. We had a lot of unhappy nurses and medical personnel in hospitals. And, and for a while there, they just didn't seem to be very happy places to be. And of course, that's something that has an impact on parents and patients uh, when they visit these institutions. And so personal experience matters an awful lot. And that's precisely why service quality and getting service quality right uh, is important. Uh, those are the, the, the five key trends that I want to cover. I want to just now take a brief look at success factors and enablers of doing those things well. There are uh, six of them here mentioned and, and uh, let, let's start with public service leadership. I, I don't think that we talk talk about public service uh, anything like as much as we should in the, in the public service. Our, our organizations are huge, they're significant, they're big employers, they, they do very, very important work. And I've learned personally, through personal and professional experience, that driving significant change, driving significant reform and keeping our organizations strong requires strong leadership. I, I was actually surprised how much of my own time this required as a public sector CEO and, and frankly how much communications mattered again and again and again. I, I had some key messages, I had my own key priorities, but um, in a busy, just in time, 24 hour news channel world, just because the CEO of a public sector organization sends out a memo uh, does not begin uh, an aggressive change process. It has to be really driven and it has to be driven by strong leadership. Uh, secondly, uh, business driven IT is a critical success factor. Um, and I say business driven because 
IT information technology is an enabler. We have to have figured out where we want to go before we decide how IT can enable and support us in getting there. I've, I've, I've used the example of modernizing our back office services in, in the province of Ontario here. And, and I learned that building corporate platforms, IT platforms, HR platforms, for example, for back office integration play, paid huge dividends in terms of enabling front counter integration. Uh, getting serious about a high level and strategic human resources strategy is hugely important as well. Uh, I can't tell you how many organizations, including some very significant and large international organizations, uh, have, have poor HR capacity and, and it really drags their performance down in, in so many ways. When, when, when I see a good HR strategy, it should be aligned with the public service reform strategy with the priorities of our leaders. It should touch on growing leadership talent management, how we're managing the talent in our organizations, how we're managing performance, the performance of our employees, the, the, the top flight performance, and, and perhaps as importantly, the performance that's substandard that we sometimes tend to overlook because we'd rather not have tough conversations uh, with, with, with underperforming staff. Employee engagement is huge. The, uh, the ability of our staff to know that they can have input and that their advice is welcomed and they'll be listened, listened to. And of course, capacity to support culture change. The next thing I'm going to touch on is developing policy based on evidence. Uh, that's really important uh, and this obviously requires access to, to good data. And uh, a, a current example of this that, that occurred to me the other day is in the, in the post-riot environment environment of the UK right now. We saw lots of trouble on the streets there. Um, and and I've, I've heard about Prime Minister Cameron's focus on trying to tackle the 120,000 most troubled families in the UK. These are, these are people who data tells us uh, are in most contact with the justice system, with the police, with the courts, with the prison system, with social services and community service agencies. Um, we now know in the UK that, um, that there are about 120,000 of them. We know that they're very troublesome and uh, problematic families. We know as well because of that that they suck up huge amounts of public sector funding delivered in siloed and, and, and uh, siloed uh, methods through fragmented organizations that, that aren't wrapping around them and having a significant uh, impact. The UK has now mapped where those families are. It, it knows where they're clustered and, and not surprisingly they're in large, uh, the lower income uh, areas in, in large uh, urban centres in London, in Birmingham, in, in Tottenham, in Liverpool in Man and in Manchester. But knowing where they are now enables a, a targeted community level intervention involving all of the appropriate support agencies. And, and, and that that's, a, I think, a terrific example of evidence-based policy uh, because, because several years ago in the UK, they'd say, you know, we have this lost generation of people out there. We know they're there. We're not quite sure how, we, how, uh, how, to, how to approach them. Uh, we know it's a problem. We just don't know how to start tackling it. Well, by identifying the most problem families, by identifying where they are and then aligning services around them, uh, there is at least a chance that over a long period of time that some of the very complex issues uh, that are exhibited by those families can be tackled. And I, I thought that was a really kind of current, vibrant example of an evidence-based approach to a very, very thorny and difficult problem. Uh, finally, I, I think if there's one challenge that I think all of our organizations face, it's it's a cultural reluctance to cross organizational boundaries where we're comfortable within our professional silo, we're comfortable within our department uh, or our ministry. And, uh, and we need to uh, feel equally comfortable in crossing those organizational boundaries in, in developing 
uh, plans together, in developing policy together, and in driving delivery together. Uh, I have done this in some small ways, uh, and I know that when we do this well, we can move mountains. Uh, when we don't do it so well, uh, we're found to be wanting by the citizens that we serve and uh, the leaders that we serve. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you uh, uh, for your attention. And uh, now over to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tony uh, Dean. Uh, uh, audience, if you have any questions, uh, you must be seeing a hand icon on your webinar console. Please feel free to raise your hand. Okay, we have a question. Uh, I will unmute you, Mr. Rakesh Belmo. Uh, please do introduce yourself before asking the question. Let me unmute you, Mr. Rakesh. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Jaffrey. Uh, I'm Rakesh Belwal, presently working in Soha University of Oman as an associate professor. Okay, thank you. Um, I have experience of working in the area of e governments and the research. Uh, I was earlier in Addis Ababa University, Ethiopia. So we have, we have, we have, I have uh, taken a few researches which are published in some leading journals. My question to Dr. Tony is, uh, first of all, I must thank him for such a nice uh, presentation and in fact it was an eye-opener and uh, he really provided some leading examples in the area of uh, progress secured by developed countries. Uh, so, but um, generally my experience has been in uh, developing and underdeveloped countries. So, I have a question like government, governments in the developed world are generally proactive in dealing with uh, public services. Uh, how, in your opinion, public service reforms can be introduced when there is no political will on the part of governments? And I raise this question, in, especially in context of the recent uh, and ongoing agitation uh, in India, where citizens are demanding for a strong ombudsman bill, uh, and ruling party and the oppositions both are unable to take a clear stance. Mr. Tony, please. Yes, uh, well, that's a, it's a terrific question, and uh, because of that, it's also a very difficult question. Um, I, I, I think that uh, the the answer is this, that, that I, have, uh, I have seen governments and I've worked with governments in Canada that, that do not have a great interest in public service reform. I, I think for this reason that as uh, when I talk about public service leadership and, and we, 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 have, uh, we have in India a a well-trained, uh, disciplined uh, public service, civil service with a great reputation. There's a delegation coming uh, over to the, the, uh, the University of Toronto in a couple of weeks. I think it's incumbent on our public service leaders where they are able to do this, and I, and I do qualify it that way, where they're able to do it comfortably with, with putting proposals and recommendations in front of their political colleagues and making the case, and I believe that the case can be made, that that good public service pays very important political dividends. That there is, that, that look, looked at through a political frame, our, our political leaders, uh, uh, many of whom need to stand for, uh, for election, or re-election uh, should be able to say that their government works well and that it's delivering good results for citizens, that it's delivering good results with high quality at an affordable price. And, and it should be able to point to public service improvements that have touched citizens and their families. And in many respects, that's what public service reform is all about. So, so for example, when, um, uh, when I talked to my own premier in Ontario about uh, wanting to reinvigorate public service reform here, it was, it, was a, it was a discussion about here's what's in this for you and here's how this can help you. And, and when, when my premier came to me and said, Tony, I want to improve student test scores. 
I want to get hospital wait times down in emergency rooms. I, I said, you know, we're, we're probably going to be able to do that, Premier, but we're going to need to change the way we do business in the public service if we're going to deliver on that for you. And, and the two really go hand in hand. I, I think that, I think that in, in, as public servants, we often are very careful not to cross the line into politics. But when it comes to service, public services and the reform and modernization of, of public services, there is no line in terms of interest and motivation between the public side and the, and the political side. So um, uh, I think that a big part of the answer here lies in the readiness and leadership of, of the heads of public services to make that case to governments. Yeah, Dr. Ren, thank you. Yeah, really, your concern is genuine that uh, there should not be, there should be a line between the politics and the public services. But unfortunately, this is not in case of India where the, you know, politics mainly dominates the public services. Whatever they will, they, they try. Where there is no will, they don't try because most of the ministers, they are, you know, in corruptions and they, they, they lead their party in that way. But anyway, uh, your answer, uh, your concern somehow, you know, they, they, they reflect that this way, if, if, if both the sides, they think that uh, their goal is super, super, you know, ordinate goals which they should look for. So naturally there should be something. Thank you. Yes, much. you're welcome. Yeah. So, Rakesh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jaffrey. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, audience. Uh, anybody else has a questions? So they can uh, please feel free to raise your hand, and I'll be able to unmute you. Any other questions? Uh, okay, we have another question. Uh, Noman Ishtiak. Uh, Noman, um, I have unmuted you. Could you please introduce yourself and ask any questions to Dr. Dhoni Dean? Yes, hello. Good evening from Islamabad in Pakistan. Uh, my name is Noman Ishtiak. I work for the government as an independent consultant. Um, my, two brief questions from my side. One is, um, in your opinion, uh, what are the prerequisites of a civil service reform program in a country? And number two question is, how do you create demand for accountability in the government? Thank you. Uh, okay, on the, uh, again, two, two very good questions. Um, prerequisites for a public service reform program. Um, I, I think, first of all, a... Um, a demand or uh, a platform that makes it that makes it necessary. In some cases, that might be an economic one. In in uh, in my country and certainly in this province, uh, one of the uh, an important precondition was government was running out of money. It was deep in debt, and we had to find a different way of delivering services. If if that had uh, even without that, we were finding that citizen demands and expectations were outstripping our ability to deliver. And so, so to some extent, there has to be, uh, I think, pressure uh, from either citizens or from our political leaders or, or, or economic pressures uh, to, to build some momentum. Uh, secondly, you need the right leadership. I mean, you need uh, a public, serious public service reform involves change and and our organizations uh, if your organizations are anything like ours here they're remarkably change resistant they they um, uh, to be fair to our public service colleagues they've they've heard about public service reform before and they've seen it fail or they've seen people distracted from it by you know by another flavor of the month uh, one of the things that I discovered in practice is that I had to be almost obsessive about leading change. Um, it, it took about probably nine to ten months for people to figure out that I wasn't going to be distracted, uh, that I wasn't going to go away and that people were either going to get on the bus uh, or they weren't. Uh, the, the third is capacity in the public service to um, to 
to deliver reform, and if we don't have the right capacity, we have to make the uh, the necessary decisions to uh, to, uh, to 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 change that. Um, and um, and I mean, I I'll, I'll stop there. But th those I think are all important prerequisites. So the last one: a polit support from our political leaders, which generally speaking, when we ask for that support, I. I find that it's 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 uh, it, it's often provided as long as we can uh, make the 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 case for reform. Demand for accountability. Um, I think the demand for accountability it goes hand in hand with the increasing pressure on all of us to deliver results. Um, I, I mean, uh, when when my Premier or Prime Minister started to say, "Well, okay, I, I know that we've fallen a bit behind on this, Tony, but but who's in charge? Who's who, who do I need to talk to? Who's who's holding the pen on this, or who's who's leading implementation?" And and um, I, I found when I first took on my leadership job that I wasn't always able to answer that question as clearly as I would have liked, and it was a significant learning experience for me. So, so accountability, I think, goes hand in hand with, with successful delivery, and um, we'll often tell a good story about accountability, but but beneath that that story uh, is is a rather uneven performance. Uh, so, um, uh, the the you know, the, I, I would say that the demand for more account is indirectly driven by the demand for more and better results in public service organizations. Uh, Mr. Stiak, uh, do you have any further comments or a supplementary question on it? I think I agree with uh, what uh, um, the professor has said. Um, accountability reform programs are quite difficult and they require fundamental change in the way politicians, uh, the legislature and executive uh, interact with each other. Uh, and I also agree with the fact that uh, markets um, often create demand, put pressures on the political government to deliver services. Uh, but uh, you know, the question that I normally ask myself is normally related to uh, the causality question. I mean, what causes what? Is it the markets that cause uh, legislature to be more accountable, or is it the uh, good accountability or good governance principles that reform markets? So those are the kinds of questions that I normally ask myself, and I haven't quite actually understood the answers yet. Uh, but perhaps a brief uh, input from uh, the professor would be useful on this. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think I think that markets markets drive, and citizens, as as if you like, part of markets drive pressure for a, a accountability in getting services to them in in a way that is seen to provide value for money. Um, I, I, the concepts of, uh, of accountability and good governance are, are important benchmarks and concepts and principles, but on their own they don't drive anything. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I, I discovered uh, is, that, is that we, we tend to we play a bit fast and loose in governments with accountability when, when it's uh, when it's convenient for a, a, a political leader to take accountability, she or he might do that. Um, when it's convenient, perhaps for a public servant to do it, that that might be the case as well. But generally, in a North American context, I can tell you that our political leaders take on the lion's share of accountability when things go right, but also when it goes wrong. And, and one of the things that I would argue for is, is to some of that accountability or more of it to shift to public service leaders. Um, I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen a, and, and I, come, I come from the public service side as you know, but, but I've seen a number of uh, ministers struggle to explain and, and try to uh, deal with the media and, and the public and in the legislature 
on issues that really um, are the responsibility and accountability of, of a deputy minister. And um, I, I, think, I think hand in hand with the need for more public sector leadership goes the need for more public sector accountability. I, so I mean, the bottom line is that I actually don't think that that market forces have that big an impact on accountability in government other than you know thinking about this through in a sort of a democratic context how people get to vote and 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 those who who do vote get to determine whether or not they believe a government has been accountable whether it's been honest whether it's delivering results for them and in that sense that that is one of the one of the few market pressures that I think is exerted uh, on kind of Westminster uh, in Westminster style governments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shock. Um, we have a couple of other questions, so I will try to give everybody a chance. So please just bear with us. Um, uh, we have uh, Mr. Abrar Ahmed. Uh, let me just unmute you, Mr. Abrar Ahmed. Hang on a second. Yes, Mr. Abrar Ahmed, could you please introduce yourself and then ask the question, Mr. Tunghi? Hello, Mr. Ahmed, can you hear us? Hello, Mr. Abrar Ahmed, can you hear us? Uh, maybe he's not attentive at the moment, but he has raised his hand. Uh, let me mute you for a second. You can always revert if you have still if you still have a question. Uh, let me move to Mr. Atik Ahmed. Just a second. Mr. Atik Ahmed, I'm trying to unmute you, but somehow you're not being. Okay, Mr. Atik Ahmed, I think we are having some technical difficulty with your um, uh, microphone, so let me figure it out. But uh, we have another questioner, uh, hand has been raised by Mr. Kashif al Hasnan. Just a second. Yes, Mr. Hasnan, can you hear us? Hello? Mr. Hasnan? Mr. Hasnan, can you hear us? Um, unfortunately, we can't hear him also. So let me, I think. There are a couple of questions posted in the box also, question box. Uh, we have, uh, okay, let me read it out. Uh, uh, we have Mr. Okay, Mr. Atik Ahmed has also pasted, posted a question. Mr. Atik Ahmed has asked, uh, business is driven, uh, business driven IT is a wonderful concept, but how to manage it in the economies where IT has not got business-centric position. Dr. Dean. Uh, well, uh, that's that's uh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> the the the. So if I if I understand it correctly, the question is, where are our IT support or our IT companies in certain jurisdictions uh, do not have a business-centric or business-focused uh, approach or capacity, is that what we're asking? Yeah, exactly. I mean, where basically, uh, from what I also understood, where the economies where IT has not got a business-centric position, it means they're yes. not pretty much optimized or, or there's a lack of IT proficiency. Right. Um, well, with, without, I mean, in the absence of that, I mean, a couple of ways to come at it. One is that there are some jurisdictions, there are some countries where uh, the capacity simply doesn't exist and we can't, we can't snap our fingers and, and make it exist. We can, we can look to other like jurisdictions to see if there are, if there are, if, if there are, there are programs, if there's architecture, that we can uh, adapt or adopt. That's probably where, where I would go first. Um, but, but, but even if that isn't possible, I think that if we look at the other elements of reform, uh, what are other opportunities for 
for co-location um, or co uh, not co-location but integration and one of the things where we've seen significant uh, leapfrogging in uh, technology is in is in Africa and and Asia where uh, the use of cell phones uh, in uh, in uh, public service delivery has become ubiquitous I mean the 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 penetration of cell uh, uh, tower coverage and in fact cell cell phone ownership in in Kenya uh, is is as high or higher than than any other uh, place in the world developed or undeveloped or however you'd like to call it and and citizens can access their medical information their integrated medical information uh, by cell phone uh, farmers can uh, receive texts uh, showing grain prices and uh, and get alerts on weather conditions. We've seen a, a complete leapfrogging of web-based approaches to service delivery because of infrastructure issues, uh, and so much uh, delivered by uh, by phone. The the same is true of banking transactions and uh, through the I think what's what's called the M-Pesa or M-Pesa uh, system. Uh, now the important thing about this is that it may not be uh, as sophisticated. It may not have the portal capacities uh, of of, of uh, an integrated web-based portal. But but in 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 the areas in which cell phones are used to transmit and collect information and to access services, uh, it's widely dispersed across. Uh, the entire country, even the remotest parts of Kenya, uh, and I've been to some of them, you you will see um, top-up cards and top-up numbers for sale for people's cell phones. The, so so it's ubiquitous. It, it isn't it isn't uh, restricted by by geography. It isn't restricted by population density. The the infrastructure is funded and has been funded by the private sector. The pricing is set low because it has to be affordable. But if you've got uh, 90 odd percent penetration across a large population, you can set your prices low and still be very profitable. So um, there's uh, one example of, of uh, taking a slightly different approach to technology. Okay, great. Um, I think we have. Um some of the audience is posting questions in the chat box, so uh, I'll try to read. Um, I believe Mr. Hassan, who earlier we tried to get hold on the mic, but unable to get uh, to hear him. He has posted the questions. Uh, he has written, Sir, I'm Sayyid Kashif al Hassan, business graduate. Sir, I want to ask, for success factors, there should be a business-driven IT and evidence-based policy. If not, then how can then how it can affect and how to cope up with the cross-organizational issues. Please describe it. Okay. Um, well, those are, those are success factors. You, you, don't, you don't always find them. And uh, the, the, the absence of, of any one or two of these success factors isn't fatal. It, it is, uh, I'd call it, a, it does put a drag on our ability to implement uh, to implement reform, um, uh, but, 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 but I think the, the basic proposition here is that um, even without business driven IT and even without uh, experience in evidence based policy, um, we, we, can act, you know, we can get people to start talking together and working together across organizational boundaries. I mean that 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 is not the success, a success factor. That is one of the key goals of. Uh, I mean, it certainly is. A, it certainly is a success factor, but it's it has to be fundamental in driving public service reform, and and that is partly about culture change. It, it requires leadership from the top, uh, certainly, and it requires making a business case to our staff and our managers that we're way more effective, that we're way more powerful, that we can achieve so much more um, when we consolidate and integrate and work together than when we try to do things in, in a siloed and fragmented way. So um, 
we may not have the IT expertise, we may not have a corporate IT system, uh, but we certainly have a lot of high skill, uh, a passionate, smart public servants who I think need to be encouraged and, uh, and enabled uh, and frankly told uh, that it's time to cross organizational and professional boundaries and start joining up and talking together and planning together and delivering together. That, that's that's the, the basic foundational building block. And part and parcel of that is that if we've got ministries, if we've got several ministries who are all in the business of running front counters, it's all one corporation, but we're driving our driver law licenses and parking permits and our identity cards and our different offices and different front counters, we can line people up behind those counters and create common counters and, and make the service experience easier for clients. We may not be able to create the web portal, but physically in terms of bringing together infrastructure, uh, we can line up uh, people from different ministries to provide a bundle of services behind common counters. And that's, that, that, for many jurisdictions, uh, is a significant step forward. When the technology comes, we can then digitize it and, 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 and create a, a, a whole new level of economy of scale. So there are things that can be done physically with people and office space and real estate and physical counters, even in the absence of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of IT. And by the way, that can be done in the absence of evidence-based policy as well, because this is, this is really at this transactional level about, about creating common windows into government through the provision of, uh, of single physical spaces for people to walk into and access uh, all the government services that they should need. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'll try to wind up quickly, but we have a couple of more questions, so I would like to read them quickly. Um, we have another one from Mr. Abrar Ahmed, who early had raised his hand, but having some problems. Uh, Mr. Ahmed wrote, my name is Abrar Ahmed. I'm an entrepreneur had, and heading three companies, which were founded by me. One called Kaizen Nano Labs. Second, Ababil Properties and Builders. And... Uh, a third one is Tajari Traders. He has commented that it's an excellent lecture and concise. However, um, he has an interesting question and, and is uh, seeking your thoughts on it. He has asked, what are your thoughts on Islamic Sharia model of governance and public service? Uh, well, I'm, 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 ch I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's another terrific question and again, these are the most difficult ones. Yeah. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm not as familiar, and I, 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 this embarrasses me, I'm, I'm not as familiar with, with, uh, with uh, Sharia, uh, I have some sense of, of, of Sharia law, we have the operation of Sharia law uh, operating in some aspects uh, uh, in Canada, in Ontario, as you may know. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not as familiar as I should be with the way that translates into, into public administration. And um, on, 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 on this one, I just have to declare that I should, I wish I did know more. Um, I wish I could offer some, some thoughts on that, but I've long since learned at my age not to tread in areas that I have very thin knowledge of. So um, Fair enough. this Fair is proven. This is, that's proven to be the, the toughest question of all. <laughs> okay. But he has supplemented with the second part of his question, which he's asking, what are all the PPP models of public services which have been tried and tested, and which are some examples that have worked worldwide to your knowledge? That's, uh, that's a great question. We're talking about public-private partnerships. Um, uh, often used, again, driven in situations where governments are looking for uh, support from the private sector for financing, but also bringing in its engineering and systems and construction expertise. Um, what are the various approaches to this? Um, we, we have seen, um, well, first of all, examples. We've seen it used for toll highways in the UK and Canada. 
We've seen it used for the building of hospital infrastructure and schools in, 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 the, uh, in, in the UK and, and in Canada. Uh, the experience is generally good. We find that uh, going out to, to experts who are in the business of design and construction uh, as, as their professional core business obviously do these things a whole lot better than governments do. So the on-time, on-budget score tends to, uh, tends to, uh, uh, to go up. The kind of models that I've seen experimented with are ones in which uh, the, uh, the uh, contractor or the private sector partner uh, simply comes in and, and builds the school or the hospital or the toll highway and uh, hands the keys over to government when it's complete and leaves and the, uh, the facility or piece of infrastructure is then operated by public servants. Um, there are models in which the facility continues to be operated by um, uh, private sector operators. There are hybrid models, for example, in hospitals here in Canada where the, the private sector operator who designed and built the facility, or maybe even another private sector operator, runs the physical plant and maintenance systems, uh, while the medical personnel remain uh, uh, publicly funded uh, nurses and doctors. Uh, the other variation on this is, um, is how uh, uh, is payment streams. Generally, on the models that I have seen, um, the, uh, the uh, private sector contractor will, uh, will deliver the project in return for a, an amortized stream of payments, usually over 20 or 25 or, or 30 years, uh, after which, uh, in some cases, full ownership of the of the plant, of, of, of all of the facility returns to government. In some cases, some of that's paid up front. In, in other cases, for, for example, uh, in the case of toll highways, uh, the private sector contractor is paid for, is, is paid back through uh, tolls on a user pay basis. So th there are lots of examples of this um, in, in, in many countries. It tends to work well. It's controversial in those settings in which there are uh, public sector trade unions, and that's an environment that we work with in Canada, and, and, and some of that works, works very well, and, and, and sometimes it works poorly. Uh, uh, but, but this is a, a practice that is growing uh, internationally. I think governments are getting better at it. We had some, some uh, false starts in the early days. Uh, uh, we've got better at working with the private sector, and I think the private sector has got better in working with, with us. So I, I hope that touches on some of the things that you were hoping to hear. Well, I hope so, certainly. Um, uh, Professor Dean, uh, I just have a quick comment to make, and, um, and if you can further uh, shed a brief on it. Uh, you have mentioned um, uh, leadership as a pivotal role uh, in the public service. So could you comment further on the importance of communication in the leadership practice, uh, A, and B, uh, just uh, while you're placing a lot of emphasis on modern human resources practices as well, so I would like to ask you, what do you think are the two or three most important things you have learned as a CEO of a 66,000 person public service? Okay, so first on communications, and, and I'll be quick, I'll, I'll try to be a good communicator. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that communications was simple, and, and in some respects it is simple. It's about, it's about messaging, messaging to a, an audience, to a targeted audience, to achieve a particular outcome. And, and, and I learned in my job as a CEO that I... I I could not believe how many times I had to repeat the same message for ideas to get traction. So the key learning for me about communications, particularly in a leadership role, is that with, with a small group of two or three people in, in, in your office, you can get the message across eyeball to eyeball very, very quickly. If you're communicating to 
uh, a, a group of uh, two or three hundred senior managers or 66,000 workers across a province. Uh, as I said earlier, your message is often uh, out there competing for attention uh, along with a lots, of other, uh, lots of other noise. So I learned to uh, keep my messages crisp and to repeat them over and over again and I, I, I was stunned uh, in, in one experience. On, on my third or fourth annual round of leadership tours across the province talking to all of our leaders, I used the same elements of a core speech on public service reform. And, and somebody that I know and, and, and have great respect for came up to me at the end of one of these meetings and said, you know, that, that's a really good idea. I, I don't know why we haven't talked about this before. Whereas, in fact, that had been a, a part of every core communications uh, speech that I'd made in the preceding two or three years. But, but I learned that that's what it takes. It, I think in some respects people are, don't hear it the first time, they may hear it the second time, they may think it's then going to go away. And you almost have to become obsessive as a leader, I think, in making sure that you get your message across. Secondly, on modern HR, I had no idea how important the human resources function was. And, and the one that I inherited was very shallow. It, 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 it was there to help you hire staff or fire them when you needed to. Uh, and, to, and to help with the annual compensation review. But, but when I looked at how that HR capacity could help me lead change, could, could advise me on what it takes to change culture, uh, could advise me to uh, help change our approach to managing performance well, to having an open dialogue with our staff, it was terribly shallow. And, and I found it wanting in many, many areas. Areas of strength that are critical to modern, high-functioning organizations. So I changed the leadership and we invested in building new human resource capacity. And I can't tell you uh, how important uh, the, the dividends were in so many ways some of which I foresaw, but many of which I didn't. So getting HR practice right and led by top quality um, uh, leadership is, is, um, is very, very important. The two or three key lessons I've learned from leading a, a, a 66,000 person organization, if you, if you have the right leadership team, if you, if you get that leadership team on side, and in parallel with that, you get uh, political support, you can really, really significantly change the nature of your organization. But you also need to reach down into the organization to tap the hunger for change within the organization at the middle and lower levels. There are people in our organizations that know our public service isn't working well. They, they, they're fed up, they're frustrated, they know that they could do better. And in a sense, um, uh, if they see at the top of the organization somebody who's prepared to do that and who talks about it constantly and who isn't going to be distracted, you can get a, a lot of people awfully excited in a hurry. And the interesting thing about this is that you've got a group of change leaders at the top or hopefully some of you are seeing your executive team is behind you and you start to create pressure from below in the organization and suddenly you you begin to see uh, some some really interesting things happen the other thing that I'd say is that is that people look at their leaders and and in many cases want to model their behavior on the behavior of their leaders and so you have to think about as a leader walking into your office every day or the work site or the construction site or wherever we work, knowing that people are looking at you and they're saying, you know, what, what makes this person tick? So you, you want to be passionate. You want to be authentic and, and be seen as honest and ethical and somebody who's kind of honest about their weaknesses as well as their strengths. You want to be seen as being human, in other words. And you want to 
be sure that people know what your top five priorities are in terms of uh, uh, driving change and in terms of what outcomes people are looking for. Because if you don't know, they don't know, and if they don't know, they can't deliver for you. So, I mean, off the top of my head, Ali, that's probably the best I can do right now, but I think those things are fairly important. Well, thank you very much. I think that was quite elaborative. So, um, I think we can take one more question, which I believe somebody has posted. So, let me read out, and uh, that might be considered as the last question. Uh, we have Mr. Karim Shalabi, who has posted. How can government and okay let me read it from okay okay how can government and what examples of it moving away from service provision provision to regulator to regulator of services and maintaining common rights I'm not sure yes. uh, yeah if you if you could please quickly shed some light on it certainly um, well in, in my sense of the core roles, let's start with the core roles of government, of, of modern, fully functioning government. One is policy and the ability to support our political leaders in converting their political interests or priorities into action. Uh, the second one is service delivery, which is about, which is about delivering services to citizens, both, both transactional identity cards and driver's licenses, but also important human services. Uh, the third one is regulation. It's, it, it's, about, it's about choosing where government um, intervenes in the marketplace to uh, both enable and restrict certain behavior. And the most common examples, of course, of course are env environmental regulation and uh, in some cases la uh, regulation of labor standards, uh, the regulation of, of professions. And, and part of that involves the, the availability of rights, uh, rights uh, through tribunals and our justice system. Um, I mean, that's a service. Um, it's a very important service. It's, it's far more important than a transactional service. Um, but but I, I tend to think that each of these are, are separate parts of the, the architecture of government delivery. And, and I, I, I think we, we almost have to treat them separately. Um, we want strong and effective and risk-based regulation. Uh, we want, a, uh, we want a, a, a code of rights that's available and, and public and transparent and that, and that can be enforced for citizens. Um, uh, but we also want um, to be providing other services as effectively as we can, such as healthcare and education and uh, community and social services. So I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure that it's an either or. I think that we have to try to uh, uh, look at these as individual facets of government service delivery and try to make them operate, each of them operate in an optimal way. And uh, as I said at the outset, I would add policy development as, um, as a fourth one. I, I hope that uh, is, uh, is, um, uh, is sufficient to address the question. Well, I certainly hope so too. Um, uh, well, that, uh, I guess, uh, brings us towards the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tony Dean, for your time and willingness to share your information and experiences. Also, thanks to all of you who participated. Um, we are glad you could join us and uh, hope the session was helpful for you. Uh, just a reminder that I will be sending an evaluation to you by email in the next couple of days. Uh, please do take a few moments to complete it when it arrives uh, uh, in your inbox or mailbox, as it will help us improve our webinar. Um, I will. Um, also be emailing you the additional resources which uh, Professor Tony Dean has kind enough to share with us, uh, his articles uh, published on various um, uh, other uh, uh, publications. Um, I will also be emailing you the link of the recorded version of this webinar. Again, it will take a couple of days. Uh, 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 
Finally, please uh, do let us know. Uh, we are still available for any additional technical support after this webinar. You can always contact me by phone or email um, uh, for any additional assistance. Uh, uh, once again, Professor um, Tony Din, thank you very much. And um, everybody who has participated, uh, really appreciate it that you could join us today. And, and, and we hope that this session was quite useful to you all. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Alex. Thank you, sir.